What do you get when you have one woman who has experienced domestic violence, feels like she has crawled and clawed her way out of it, put that information, that story in a book for other people to read and be encouraged by, and then gets murdered by an intimate partner. It's not the makings of a funny joke. What you have is a situation that happened in 2019 and one that paralleled my life so much that people that were closest to me were, were afraid for me. They were afraid that I was gonna have the same result. This woman has had a place on my website. She was up, I think, for a year on my homepage because she meant so much just because of her story and the way that it paralleled my life. Today we're going to talk about Aaliyah Terry. If you're new here, welcome. My name is April Hardy. I am a survivor of many different types of abuse, and I am now an advocate and an educator trying to teach other people how to get out or how to avoid entirely the difficult things, the horrible things that I went through and that I know so many other people have been through. If you are not new, welcome back. Thank you for returning. I look forward to going through this story with you and bringing some light to a powerful woman who had a powerful impact in my life. Aaliyah Terry from Charlotte, North Carolina was taken to the hospital with stab wounds on July 2nd, 2019. The attack happened in her home just days before the pre-sale release of a book that she had co-authored. Aaliyah was 35 years old and the mother of two, a little boy and a little girl. She was also an entrepreneur who owned a hair business. And like I said, she was on the verge of being a published author. Let's just stop for a second and parallel this so far. In 2019, I was 35. I was a mother of two, a boy and a girl. I was an entrepreneur and I was on the verge of publishing my first book about domestic violence, stalking, sexual abuse, and how to stay safe. Is it not insane, just right there, the parallels of our lives? The people closest to me thought so, myself included. I remember reading about her story in the news and just calling my best friend and being like, is this gonna be me? Where we lived was different like states, and our skin color was different. <laughs> everything that counted, though, was the same. Or almost everything that counted was the same. The man that the police believed at the time, and they have arrested and are pursuing in court for stabbing and killing Leah Terry was her 32-year-old boyfriend, Isaiah Henderson III. Neighbors and family members told media outlets, multiple media outlets, that he was a controlling boyfriend. I'm gonna read you a couple of quotes. He has been trying to be controlling of her, like stealing her keys so she can't leave the house, a neighbor told NBC's Charlotte Richard Devine. And another quote, yesterday we were on the phone together and she said, he's about to snatch my phone and it took me hours to be able to get into contact with her. It's been escalating. According to WBTV, in the past year, there were 19 911 calls from that apartment. 19. I wanna stop again for a second. Do you know how many times I called the police on my abusers? before I got a stalker when I was in an active, abusive relationship, once. That's it. In years of abusive relationships, I called one time. I don't know about you and whether or not you have experience with domestic violence, 
but calling the police is not something that people take lightly. There are ramifications when you call the police. It starts a ball rolling that you may or may not be able to stop. She called 19 times, or they called 19 times, I guess. I'm speculating. I don't know for sure that they were all her. 19 times in a year says there's a problem. It says that the police need to be on high alert for this location. It says that it would be really good if some kind of community domestic violence response team would be able to be involved. On the night of the attack, police responded to a call at Aaliyah's residence four hours before the attack happened. There was a fight verbally around 10 p.m. and Henderson left the home. Aaliyah told the police that the situation had calmed down, probably because he left, and she didn't want to press charges. Some news accounts say 2 a.m., others say 3 a.m., but around that time, the police found her with stab wounds and took her to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. Aaliyah's ex-husband rushed to the scene the night of the attack so that he could take care of their children, who were at home when the attack happened. Media reported that he was inconsolable and said that she was a wonderful woman. Aaliyah was on the verge of getting her writing published. She wrote parts in the book The Queen Experience, which detailed her experience with domestic violence. The book was slated for pre-order release the week after Aaliyah was murdered. Nikita Davis, the book's publisher, was very proud of the contributions that Aaliyah put into the book and lamented that her inspiring story of overcoming domestic violence had ended so tragically. So much fear there in me as I read these things the first time. Davis said that Aaliyah had endured and overcome much heartache She's quoted as saying she was a beautiful person inside and out, kept a beautiful smile. Davis said that Aaliyah had hoped that her story would inspire abused women, and I hope that her story will too. Both in that book and in this, for this story, inspire you in the sense that she had overcome so much. She had clawed her way out and she was a successful single mother, a successful ex-wife. She was an entrepreneur. She was writing. She wanted to be an advocate. She had all of these things going for her. But she obviously hadn't broken the patterns yet. That domestic violence pattern and belief system that had her being this powerful woman in a position where she was still lacking power in her romantic relationship. I can relate to that too, so much. I'm in counseling yet again in trauma therapy, working specifically on trying to break some of these patterns and beliefs that are still in my life. Beliefs like, I'm broken. Nobody's gonna want me because of my experience, except for somebody who also has had a messed up life. And I did learn a long time ago that somebody else having a messed up life is fine if they are on the road to recovery also if they are also getting help getting counseling working on things moving forward in life there's a huge difference between that and finding somebody else who's already been through things who is still in the thick of things who refuses to get help who isn't growing who isn't improving their life those are very different people and I used to believe I only deserved messed up people. And I still have a really difficult time with that because belief systems are anchored deep. And if you have believed something for a long enough period of time, it is really hard to break them. The abusers are operating out of belief systems also. They believe they own you. They believe they have a right to do these things. They believe they're superior. All of those things were probably taught to them when they were very little. And they stick unless they go through the work to break it. On the victim's side, 
we also have beliefs that allow us to fall into those kinds of relationships. For some of us, over and over and over again, our beliefs that we deserve it, that we don't deserve love, that we don't deserve to be safe, that somehow it's our fault, that we are weak, that we are pathetic, etc. Those things, those beliefs, make us respond through our behavior. And Aaliyah's behavior said that even though she understood intellectually that she did not deserve the things that had been done to her, her belief system still kept her trapped in that hole. And this time it killed her. And as she was going through this, I was on the verge of publishing my book and I had just broken up with my boyfriend and I was being stalked and I was afraid for my life as I was writing a book about empowering women that I had started when I was in a much more empowered place. And that relationship brought me back very low, much like Aaliyah's, I imagine. On October 3rd, 2019, Aaliyah's loved ones wore shirts with her name on it into the courtroom, much like Rebecca Rogers' supporters did. They were crushed when the judge ruled that he wasn't going to be able to get the death penalty. One of her neighbors told Channel 9, if she's dead and gone, then that should still be an option for him. The most recent update I have on this case is on June 18th, 2020, Henderson pled not guilty, turning down a plea deal which would have guaranteed him at least 18 years in prison. He opted to go to trial for first degree murder, and so while he is not facing the death penalty, he could be looking at a mandatory life sentence. It was a short hearing here this morning, only a few minutes or so but it had a tremendous impact on the family of a young woman who had lived with and police say died from domestic violence. It's been very rough knowing that my daughter was murdered. Wanda Sanders stood between her two grandchildren and tried to pick herself up again. After watching the man charged with killing her daughter plead not guilty. And I'm asking all you women or even men that be victims to get out before you can leave so you can have a life and not happen what happened to my daughter. If you believe that your life is in danger, then it's in danger. That feeling of being afraid that your life might be in danger is your biggest warning sign that you are. You can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. You can also go to thehotline.org if you have access online. If you feel like your life is in danger, please reach out for help. If you know somebody who has expressed concern that her life may be in danger, or his, from an intimate partner or an ex, please encourage them to reach out for help. I want women to walk away knowing there's help, Davis said about the book. She said the book includes work from several women and aims to motivate and encourages women across the world to play their royal position, encouraging people to live out their God-sized dreams. And at the time of Leah's death, Davis said that 50% of the pre-order sales would go into a fund for Leah's children. The book was officially released on October 4th, 2019, which was National Sisters Day. If work Eat, sleep, repeat. Sounds like the broken record of your life. Then Queen, run, not walk, and grab this book. Sis, let me tell you a little secret. You were born to sparkle, shine, and pop. Leaving a shimmery substance on the heels of your feet and an anointed footprint on the enemy's forehead. In this awe-inspiring and authentically written collaborative book, Queens with origins from around the globe share intimate experiences, fresh perspective, and tangible tips to help you quit making excuses, understand your assignment, enlist your support cast, establish your winning team now. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther 414. Queen, 
it is time to play your royal position. Queen co-authors, Aaliyah Terry, Dr. Rashada Brown, Evangelist Yvonne Firms, Tamika Morrow, Dominique Burleson, Colleen Batchelder, Robin Mobley, T. Pringle, Jesse Moreno, Sherry Jones, Ashley Moraru, Janine Sturgis, Aya Malongo, Yolanda Powell, and Deborah Tui. In loving memory of Queen co-author Aaliyah Terry, you are now playing your heavenly position, and I will leave a link in the description where you can find this on Amazon and purchase it now if you want. Thanks for watching. Until I see you again, stay safe. Another eerie similarity is that Aaliyah was actually born four days after me. That's it. Four days. I didn't realize that until doing the research for this video. I think that that was one of the parallels that I had missed and it would have freaked me out much more.